Hello, my name is Greg Crinklaw and I'm the developer of Sky Tools. And I would like to give you an introduction to the brand new Sky Tools for Imaging. And to give you an idea of the role that Sky Tools for Imaging plays in your imaging process, I want to ask you a question. Why do you need a map app on your phone? And you've already got a car and you've got maps in the glove compartment. And their answer is that the map app actually helps you find places to go. It helps you determine when you should get there. And it helps you plan your route and taking into account things like traffic and so forth. And that's the role that SkyTools 4 imaging plays. You already have a telescope. You already have software. You already have control system software, say like ACP, or your own camera control software. What SkyTools does is helps you select target objects that are suitable for your imaging system. Helps you decide when to observe those objects on a particular night and maximizes your signal to noise ratio. So I'm going to give you uh, demonstration of how that works. So we've got a list here of planetary nebulae. You can download lists like this from the website. Um, people can share lists with you. You can create your own lists using various tools within Sky Tools. And once you have a list, the idea is to narrow it down to figure out which objects are most suitable for your telescope. And this, by the way, is the target selection tool. So I'm going to start by setting it up so that I want to achieve a signal to noise ratio of 20. And I want my objects to be above 1.5 air mass. And I'm going to enable a filter. And what I've done here is I've said that it can't take more than two hours to reach a signal to noise ratio of 20. And it has to be above 1.5 air mass for at least 60 minutes. So this has narrowed the list down to 41 objects that are best observed in this imaging system, regardless of the time of year. Now I have this thing set up for August 30, 31st. And I'm going to enable the night filters. Now at this point, we're showing objects that have a, an imaging quality of A for at least 60 minutes during the night. What does imaging quality mean? This blue line here is the relative imaging quality throughout the night. And what that means is, if it's near the top, when the imaging quality is, is at its highest, that is when you can achieve the most signal to noise ratio with your imaging system for this object. If it's down at the bottom, then you're not achieving any signal to noise ratio. And that's a very important parameter in Sky Tools. It's called the imaging quality or IQ. And it's graded. And we have decided that we only want the very best imaging quality on this night. Imaging quality of A. So there's one more thing. What about image scale? If the planetary nebula only covers two pixels, then you're not going to get a very Im interesting image. So let's add a scale filter. And again, this is a graded scale. I'm going to go with a scale of C because planetary nebulae tend to be small. A scale of A would mean it sort of nicely fills the image. We can also allow tiles if we want to do that, but we're just going to go with a single frame and an image scale of C. So now we've narrowed it down really well. And there are planetary nebulae here that I'm already imaging or are famous, but I've already chosen one here, a Minkowski nebula, that I think I might want to image. So let's look at a chart for that. Let's start with an overhead sky chart. So this is right at the beginning of the night. I'm going to time step by 20 minutes each time. Here's our object. You can see that the night gets darker and our object does indeed get 
quite high in the sky. So it's very well placed. I'm going to open the interactive atlas next. So we can see a general idea of, of where it's at. Lacerda over here, this is the North American Nebula. I'm going to uh, zoom in here. I already downloaded a digital sky survey image and plotted that in the background here so you can see what the nebula sort of looks like. I'm going to open the camera view. Now this is what we're going to record in a 300 second exposure in the luminance filter. Um, you can see that it's sort of small but it, it covers quite a few pixels. Here this is the field of view of our of our image of our camera and this is the field of view of the guide camera and we'll get back to that in a bit but back to the target selection tool now let's think about exposure i'm going to open the exposure calculator and set it for a which is the best period of the night and it has chosen this period of the night for this filter i'm going to go to the luminance filter actually and we can see that looking at our imaging quality line here, the moment the moon rises, this is the altitude of the moon here, the moment it rises, that thing takes a pretty good drop. So if we're going to image in the luminance filter, it's going to be during this period of the night. But look what happens to the H-alpha filter. That's high all night long, even when the moon's high in the sky. And if we go to the O3 filter, it's almost as good. It drops off pretty good later in the night when the moon's high in the sky, but we can image at least to midnight, if not later. So that gives us an idea of what's available for this night. And the different filters, this just sort of scratches the surface of what this exposure calculator can do, but that's all we need for, need for it right now. So I'm going to go ahead and create an imaging project. That's the next step for our object here create new imaging project. I'm going to assign it to my observing program and I'm going to move on to the composition and tiles tab. Now here we can drag this around and, and position where our field of view is going to be and I'm going to move it up here. This little circle here is the um, planetary nebula and I moved it up a little bit to exclude this bright star this here is the field of view of the auto guider and the stars marked in green are stars that are within the range of the auto guider that it likes to guide on. They're not too bright, they're not too faint. And as you can see, there's tons of them in this field. So I could rotate, take this around anywhere and there's plenty of guide stars. Let's just go with where we were. Now moving on to exposure goals. Let's start over here and let's say we want to achieve a pretty high picture quality. So we're going to go for a signal to noise ratio of 30. And that is for the main extent of the object. We could choose very faint regions if we wanted to. It would be harder to achieve a signal to noise ratio of 30 though. So we'll go for the main extent of the nebula. And now we're going to add some filters. We'll go with the LRGB plus the narrowband filters. <clears throat> so what we've got here, if in this column, it tells us how long it's going to take to achieve that signal to noise ratio of 30. And you can see we've got quite a bit of time in some of the filters. In the green filter, it's going to take almost 18 hours. Now, why is that? And the answer is, is this particular green filter is fairly narrow and it excludes the O3 line for the nebula. So it's not capturing very much not light from the nebula because it's an emission line object. So I'm going to go back and forget doing LRGB imaging and do the luminance, H-alpha, and O3 filters instead. And we're still looking at some pretty long observation time. So I'm going to customize the O3 filter to use two times binning and that brought it down considerably going to do the same thing for the H-alpha. <clears throat> and that looks pretty good. This is doable. It might take a little bit more than one night, but it's not a huge amount of observing time. So we've created our imaging project. The next thing to do 
is to set it up to observe. So I'm going to move on to the scheduler. Give it a moment here. And listed on the left side here are all the projects that I have currently defined for this imaging system. Things that I want to observe. And what the scheduler does is it creates a schedule for a night or a part of the night that maximizes your signal to noise ratio. That schedule is the most efficient schedule possible. And I could just click auto schedule here and it will schedule these objects as best it can for the entire night. But I'm interested in the project that we just created, so I'm going to select it and I'm going to add it manually to the schedule. So this is the schedule it has created starting around 2100. The first thing it's going to do is a little strange. It's chosen to do 58 one minute exposures even before the moon comes up in the luminance filter. Now this particular camera is a very low signal to noise ratio camera. So it has run through all the calculations, tried various exposure times and concluded that we can get the most signal to noise ratio by using one minute exposures. And that probably has to do with the fact that uh, it's a low read noise camera. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this and choose the report. And this tells us what we can expect to achieve on this night. So in the luminance filter, in our 58 one minute exposures, we're going to get a signal to noise ratio of 20. Remember our goal was 30, so we're not going to finish it this night. Then followed by eight 10 minute exposures at uh, bin times two. This is going to achieve our 30, um, our signal to noise ratio of 30. And in H alpha, four 10 minutes of um, images can achieve our signal to noise ratio target of 30. And if we look up here at the top, we can see in each of the individual observations, this here represents the luminance filter observation and this block here of green is the best time of night to observe that luminance filter. Remember when the moon came up it dropped off considerably so it's just going to do the luminance first until the moon rises and then it's going to move on and do the H alpha and then finally the O3. So this is our schedule. Now at this point if we were using, say, ACP scheduler, I'm sorry, if we were using ACP, we could create an ACP plan. This teles particular telescope doesn't use ACP, but we could go ahead and create an ACP plan, which we could then upload to ACP and execute on this night so that it would do the observations automatically. Now, if you're an eye telescope user, this works the same way for eye telescope. You could go ahead and create an ACP plan for a period of the night during your reservation or when you're planning to observe and upload that plan to the telescope. If you're doing things very manually, like let's say you've got a DSLR and a tripod, you could just print the schedule out and take it with you to the field. If you've got direct control of the telescope with sky tools and we use this tab here and we can skip the whole schedule part if we want it's going to list here all of our projects now nothing's really working here because it's the middle of the day but normally at night it's going to list the project over here and it's going to put the project at the top that it thinks we should be observing right now and we would connect to the telescope and then we would select the project we want to observe and sky tools will move the telescope and tell us guide us as to which filters we should be using and how long the sub exposures should be and how long we should be observing for if we have acp expert with scheduler we can use this tab and this is a different telescope that uses scheduler, so I can show you a little bit of how it works. This is a project that, that has been de designed for this telescope. And I can just click Submit here, 
and it will automatically log into ACP Scheduler, submit the project, and when it does that, it'll calculate the best possible constraints to use, which are listed here. And Scheduler will then go ahead and use those constraints. Now I'm going to view a report. And what this does is it gives us an idea, based on those constraints, what Scheduler is going to do. And because of the moon, it's not going to start observing until September 9th. These filters here will be available for these periods of time. And somewhere in there, Scheduler, if the weather's good, will go ahead and start scheduling. And it's up to it, depending on the constraints that Sky Tools has calculated, when it's going to go ahead and observe each of those filters. When we're done with that, we can query the status of Scheduler, and it'll tell us what's been done. And those will be automatically logged so that the next time we go to submit to Scheduler, it will only submit what we need to submit. So there's your quick introduction to Sky Tools for imaging. We chose suitable target objects for our imaging system. So we don't choose objects that we cannot achieve a high signal to noise ratio for. And then we went through a quick example of how you would go ahead and create an imaging project and then different ways that you could observe that imaging project. And I should say at this point that Sky Tools also works really well for things like astrometry, photometry, DSLR imaging. All of these things apply. So there you go. Sky Tools for imaging.